The Tom Woods Show, episode 1960. Prepare to set fire to the index card of allowable opinion. Your daily dose of liberty education starts here. The Tom Woods Show. Hey folks, don't even think about missing the libertarian event of the year, the 2000th episode of The Tom Woods Show, live in Orlando, featuring many of your favorites from The Tom Woods Show. And Michael Malice says his special surprise guest, whose identity I myself don't even know, will bring the house down. Cost nothing to attend. Register at TomWoods2000.com. Hi, folks. Tom Woods here, and we're joined today by Derek Brose, who is a freelance investigative journalist, a documentary filmmaker, an author, and public speaker. And we're going to talk in particular about his book released last year called How to Opt Out of the Technocratic State. Derek, welcome to the show. Hey, thanks for having me on, Tom. Before we jump into the specifics of our topic, let's go back a bit and get the big picture here because you've done or you've learned quite a bit from Sam Konkin and probably read material by him that most people have not read. And I've done some episodes on on his work and his ideas, but not that recently. So can we take a little time to have you explain who he was and what made his contribution to the way libertarians think important. Sure. So Samuel Edward Conkin III, as some audi- of the audience will be familiar with, is the founder or the discoverer, however you want to phrase it, of agorism or agorism, depending on your, your accent. He started promoting this idea that rather than playing the political game or you know thinking that insurrection, violence, et cetera, is the answer for libertarians, that there could be a third way, a sort of middle path, if you will, and he termed that to be counter-economics. And specifically when he was talking about what he called new libertarianism, because you know he was associated with Rothbard, he worked with Rothbard, he worked with Carl Hess, he was very active in the, the student movements in the 60s, 70s. And he was trying to play on some of the language of the time. And so you had the new left, you had the counterculture. So he came up with the new libertarianism and counter-economics. And counter-economics wasn't to say, you know, against economics, like just be ignorant on economic issues. It was definitely an Austrian economic position, but Konkin believed that the most consistent, like principally consistent and sound libertarian position was not to play the political game, but instead to start trying to remove ourselves from the state's institutions, specifically the economy, the Fed, and trying to support alternative means of exchange and Again, he started talking about this idea in the 60s. He started writing the first book, New Libertarian Manifesto, in the 70s. And then he they published one more, the Agorist Primer, right before he died or right after he died. And beyond that, he had written quite a bit, but it never got published. And his ideas you know, did have some impact when he was around. Rothbard gave him some good support as well as critiques of his ideas. And he ended up dying in 2004. I discovered the ideas through a previous guest of yours, John Bush just about a decade ago and have just kind of been enthralled with them. And really it sort of fits the lifestyle that I, I choose try to stay out of the, the government's hand as much as possible. And I just decided to start trying to expand upon some of the ideas. And that's sort of where, you know, today's conversation comes in because another one of your previous guests, Victor Komen, he, as you know, is trying to save the agorist archives, the archives of Samuel Konkin and he discovered Konkin's third unfinished, never published book that was just simply titled Counter Economics. That Konkin appeared to have like a very big vision for it. He wanted this to sort of rival Marx's Das Kapital and sort of be the you know the Counter Economic Manifesto. And he had written quite a bit of it, but it never was able to find a publisher. And pretty much it just kind of languished and got lost on some computers until it was recently discovered. And so when I published my book that we're going to be talking about today. Because my work is so inspired by him, I felt sort of a, a service to put it into publishing because the third book of his, you can find it out there. It's a free ebook now, thanks to Victor. And that's really awesome. But there's nothing like holding a physical book and being able to read the words. And so yeah. I decided I wanted to publish his unfinished book as the sort of third part of my book that we're talking about today. Okay. Well, I'm looking at the release date here on uh, Amazon for how to opt out of the technocratic state. And it's telling me January, 2020. Now, how interesting that timing, because of course, uh, the world ended two months later, it seemed to, <laughs> to many of us, I mean, all the craziness happened. Yeah. And now, of course, we're, we're hearing that before you enter 
all kinds of establishments and venues, you're going to have to produce some kind of paper or something digital in order to get in. Now, the question, of course, arises, do I want to get into an establishment like that? I'm I'm so filled with moral outrage about that system that I don't, I'm not so sure that I do. But it is spreading, particularly in the cities. Now, that's not so much a a matter of surveillance, really, but it is nevertheless uh, an attempt to control the movements of the population. So that could be a book in itself, but it certainly could have been a chapter in this book. But it was quite prescient of you to have released a book on this general sort of topic, just as this type of electronic oppression was just about to ramp up. Yeah, so I've actually been thinking, I've been talking to my publisher about releasing an updated version for the English uh, edition. And the only change I really need to make is insert the word vaccine passport in there somewhere, and then it's totally, you know, completely relevant. But I wrote this book late 2019, going into 2020, and we published January 2020. So just a few weeks before the world, you know, got used to the word COVID-19 and we heard there was a pandemic. But even without that knowledge, just from a journalistic perspective, doing a lot of work, particularly in Houston, where I'm originally from, focused on surveillance issues, focused on the philosophy in the book that we talk about, the technocracy, what that really means. It became clear to me that these kinds of problems were already on the horizon. Now, I didn't know, I never heard of a vaccine passport. I didn't include anything about that in the book. But I did talk about things like the social credit score that is already in use in places like China and in some ways is being kind of brought to the U.S. more through private institutions, actually. And in addition to that, mass surveillance in the sense of facial recognition cameras. And in the uh, book, I mentioned a few different examples of different organizations researchers, AI scientists, et cetera, warning about the dangers of facial recognition and just saying like, hey, we're sort of rushing blindly into this world where people are going to have so much data about us and so much understanding of our day-to-day lives. And this can affect people in any number of different ways. And so I was kind of writing from that perspective, but also trying to, again, bring Konkin's work to the masses for people who are understanding, people who say, you know what, I do see this surveillance issue. I do see even before COVID, I see increasing kind of authoritarianism coming from the governments around the world. And many people believe some of the leaders in the U.S. would like the U.S. to reflect what's happening in China, where they have facial recognition that can identify anyone in the cities within, they say, you know, seven minutes at most. And in addition to the social credit score that can decide based on your social behavior, whether or not you get privileges to fly or travel or go to work, et cetera. So people were kind of already concerned about this, but I didn't see too many people talking about solutions. And for me, and this rings even more true, now here we are a year and a half into COVID, that the main answer is to just not be dependent on their systems. And that looks different for different people. But if you are completely engrossed and sucked into the state's systems and you're dependent on them, say, for the social security check or for your your veterans monthly check or for your 401k or you know whatever it may be, if you're dependent on these institutions, corporate and state, it can very much end up in a situation where your freedom is going to be limited. Well, in reading your book, I found, I came across a section where you talked about the different ways that people might either be tracked or that information about people might be made available. Some of them are obvious, like social media. You know, you have control over how much information about yourself you put out that you can tell the world a lot or a little, but that is obviously one channel. But you were going through all the different sorts of things that you might want to disengage from, either completely or to some extent, if you want to limit your exposure. And and some of them see and you you acknowledge this in the book, some of them seem a little extreme, the types of things that people might wind up doing. So what sort of practical advice are you giving people about you know, limiting, frankly, what's known about them. Yeah, so some of the examples, as you point out, I, and I acknowledge, are going to be extreme for some people. I mean, I, I say like, okay, stop using social media, stop using your credit cards, stop, you know, et cetera, et cetera. All the different ways that you are leaking data. One of the insights I did get from Conkin's Counter-Economics book, which I think is really relevant for libertarians, because I notice that sometimes libertarians, we might only exclusively focus on state tyranny and sort of, forget to acknowledge that tyranny can come in private forms as well. It can come from you know private businesses. Of course, we have more of a choice in that sense, but it still exists. And I, I tried to show people that 
If you're going to seek to maintain some semblance of privacy, and again, that's dependent on different people. Some people are going to go the total gray man tactic, like nondescript clothes and anonymous emails and all that. Others are just going to kind of live their lives, but they still don't want Big Brother poking in their business. Konkin talked about what he termed interfacing with society. And basically, you have an information flow. You're either going to be having information flowing to you as people give you information about themselves or information flowing from you to corporations or the state or other people on social media. And that's just an individual choice you need to make. You need to understand that every time you sign up for some list with your email, then you might start getting spam in because you've now just sent out some information, some data about you. And others are going to pick up on that and they're going to use it to sell you things or whatever it may be. It could be as simple as trying to make a profit off you, or it could be some things more nefarious. But it's all about trying to understand that information flow. So each of us are going to have different situations. Like I said, I tend to kind of live on some of the more extreme end. I've severed my relationship with the federal government as much as possible. And I, I haven't you know, personally used a bank account in over a decade. And you know that creates complications and things that I've had to learn to maneuver around. Some people aren't going to want to go that route, but they might say, hey, I don't want Facebook knowing everything about my life. So I'm going to just delete my Facebook account. Or at the least, as you said, I'm going to limit what I put on there. I'm not going to check in every location I go. I'm not going to leave my um, my Google Maps running all the time so that Google has a record of every place I've ever been. And maybe even better than that, somebody might say, I'm going to choose an open source alternative to Google Maps and and stop giving Google my data. I'm going to support companies that that don't do that. Or in the same sense, trying to limit the information you're giving to the state. So for some people, that could be like, I'm not going to participate in the census when that rolls around. I'm not going to answer the doors when government agents come knocking at the door or to bring it more relevant to our time. I'm not going to answer when somebody asks me if I've been vaccinated or if I've taken this treatment or whatever, you know, because prior to COVID, those sort of things were seen as impolite to ask about, you know, that's your private personal information. Now it seems to be people think it's public, but at the end of the day, individuals just have to decide what they're willing to have out there. And I think in terms of what we're dealing with now with the imposition of vaccine passports, as they're being called around the world, and even in the United States, LA, New Orleans, San Francisco, New York City, some of these places, like you said, the major cities are starting to do them. And those are not working kind of in isolation or in a vacuum. Those are going to be working in cooperation with things like facial recognition cameras. And we're seeing this in places like Australia and some of the other countries that are already becoming a little bit more authoritarian, where in addition to your QR code on your your smartphone, they also are able to track your location via facial recognition or contact tracing apps. And they can tell if you've been in the wrong locations, you know, the quote unquote wrong locations around the wrong people, or if you've been near what they would call a hot spot. And so you start to see how all of this different infrastructure working together really doesn't lend itself towards more liberty, to say the least. Well, what do you say to people who say, look, I'm not doing anything wrong. I don't get in trouble. It doesn't matter. Even if they do track me in ways I'm unaware of, all they're going to find is that I went to the coffee shop and I went home. You know, I, I have nothing to fear. Yeah, and that's something that, I mean, I know that you've, you've been at this longer than I have, Tom, and I'm sure you've heard that countless times, especially in the post-9-11 era, right? Whenever people were speaking out against the Patriot Act or the concerns around that, there were so many people saying, you know, well, I'm not doing anything wrong. I have nothing to hide. You know, unless you're doing something illegal, you shouldn't be worried about it. But I think it's clear that not only is that a naive perspective, like, yes, you might not have anything yourself to personally hide. Well, first on that, usually when someone says that to me, I ask them to hand me their phone and say, can I look through your phone? And typically you see like a sort of hesitance of, well, okay, maybe I do have some things that I'd like to keep personal. Doesn't mean they're doing anything illegal. Doesn't mean they're cheating on their wife. Maybe it's just their personal thoughts, whatever. It's their phone. you know. So I think most people do have some semblance of wanting to keep part of their lives private, even if they generally feel like, oh, I'm nobody, I'm not doing anything. But I think also taking it to more of a kind of historical perspective, privacy is intrinsically connected to liberty. If we do lose our semblance of privacy, if we lose the ability to be free in our homes, in our own thoughts, in our own affairs, then I don't know how other liberties really come into play, right? I mean, maybe you could say, well, I'm still free to go about and travel and move around. Well, with a vaccine passport these days, 
And you don't mind if you're being monitored everywhere you go 24-7 from the internet of things, all the sensors that they want to put up, the smart lights, the, including in this recent infrastructure bill with, from Biden, they're bringing in a lot of the smart city infrastructure, which is part of the surveillance, which is part of the technocracy. You might be a person that says you don't care about that, but that might change in the future. You know, it's not just about how you feel at the moment. We have to understand that not only the corporations, but the governments and private security forces are gathering immense amount of data about us. And it might not be useful in the present moment, but it could be useful in a future time. And maybe something that you've said or thought right now is acceptable. You know, it's on that allowable, that card of allowable opinion. But as we know, things are rapidly changing and you might get to a point where something you've done or said in the past is now illegal or immoral or just, you know, not polite. And it can be used against you because this data isn't going anywhere. It's being stored and it's being used to study us. It's being used to sell us things, but it also could be used to punish us for various wrong think, whether that's in the present moment or in the near term future. Yeah. I mean, if I had to work for somebody, especially if I work for a big corporation that wants to have stability, it wants good PR, it doesn't want to get in trouble. Oh man, I would not be free to say the kinds of things I want to say. And they would drop me like a bad habit if I ever caused them the tiniest bit of trouble. Mm -hmm. So I'm lucky that I, I'm able to more or less work for myself and be independent. But that would be a tough spot to be in. So I think one way I've been able to make a little headway with people with stuff like this is to, in the same way with libertarianism, sometimes I, I point out to people ways in which they're already libertarians or ways in which they're already anarchists in certain parts of their lives without fully realizing the implications. So for example, I think these sorts of examples have been given numerous times. There really aren't that many people who drive 55 on the highway. There just are, are not. If you drive 55, you're going to get run off the road. But 55 is the law. And yet you're going 70. So, you know, what does that mean about you, right? About you and your relationship with authority. Or you have a yard sale and you do not report the income to the IRS. What is that telling us about the relationship between you and that authority? So you can tell me all day long about the legitimacy of this and that, and we have to be good citizens, but actions speak louder than words. And a lot of times people do things that don't conform to the belief system about the state that they claim to believe in. So they are already kind of, you know, 1% of the way there. It's just a matter of looking for places where you can still carve out some kind of free existence in your life here and there. And if I may add to that, Tom, everything you just described there would be considered a counter-economic act because as, you know, with... Uh, with Mises, human action, Konkin tried to take it further and say, counter-economics is specifically all human action that is peaceful and nonviolent, but is forbidden by the state or, you know, frowned upon. So like you just mentioned, you know, not going the speed limit, you're not bringing down the state by speeding a little bit, but in a sense, it is a counter-economic activity because the speed at which you go determines how quickly you get to your destinations, which might, you know, lead to a better performance at work, or at least, you know, being looked upon more as a stronger employee, and that could lead to different rewards. There's all kinds of different ways, but also the yard sale, the garage sale. People don't typically go and get a license or a permit to do that. They're just voluntarily exchanging with their neighbors, and that's a counter-economic activity. And again, to bring it to the current kind of situation we're facing with vaccine passports and these mandates popping up, people are already using fake PCR tests to travel who don't want to have a thing stuck up their nose. They're using negative tests that people are, you know, there's like a whole industry, a kind of a counter economic industry that's already started up. There are people who are trying to think about ways to get around uh, vaccine mandates. You know, there are some businesses that are not complying. Each of those are counter economic activities because people are choosing to say, you know what, the state says this, but we're not going to do that. Instead, we're going to, I'm going to take business people. If they want to come in and buy from my shop without a vaccine passport, I'm going to accept it because. I need money or because, you know, whatever it may be, those are counter economic acts. The individuals are choosing whether consciously or unconsciously to say, you know what, screw you state and your demands. I'm going to do what I need to do. I need to trade with people. I need to exchange with people. I need to make a living. And that is, I think, one of the most powerful insights about counter economics. And Konkin gives examples from 
the collapse of the Soviet Union and how big the black market was there, as well as in my book, I talk about what they called the informal economy in Peru in the 70s, as there was just, you know, it's a whole situation, but essentially people were facing terrorism, both from literal Maoist terrorists and from the state. And instead, they chose to leave the cities and go to the countrysides and form their own kind of what started out as like shanty towns, and some of them kind of became more permanent, but they had their own you know, ride shares, basically kind of pre-Uber rickshaws that were all counter-economic outside the state's hands. And they didn't do it because they were thinking, we're going to be anarchist revolutionaries. They did it because they needed to, to survive. And so I feel like more people, especially in the era of COVID, what I call COVID-1984, are becoming agorists, counter-economists because they have to, because they're looking for ways out of this ever, you know, encroaching system. Yeah, I remember thinking, if this is not the biggest boon for Konkin's ideas of all time, then, then nothing is because it, it has forced millions of people to ask very, very important questions about their livelihoods and their lifestyles and frankly, what they expect out of life with all these restrictions placed on them. Virtually everybody has violated some COVID restriction. Almost everybody has a little, and I, there should have been Sam Konkin memes you know, of him, smi- you know, somebody wearing a mask down by his chin or not wearing it at all and, and him smiling, you know, with laser beams coming out of his eyes. I don't know why this hasn't been done. <laughs> Seems like a great opportunity. But this really, this has been, because, you know, before I was talking about people who they don't really think about the government and they feel like I'm a, I'm a harmless person. Nobody's going to care where I'm going. But now they do. In Australia, they do. And in some parts of the U.S., they do. That is suddenly a problem. And now... People have, they've, they've had secret get-togethers at their house. They had to have a secret get-together at their house because they had 11 people rather than 10. I mean, this is a case where you and I didn't have to go educate them about political thought. Exactly. They saw it right in their, you know, that they're observing it with their own eyes. Yeah, Tom, I'm going to be disappointed with the, your audience if after this show we don't end up with some conkin memes with laser beams coming yeah, out of the that's, right. <laughs> that's right, that's right. Well, so... What do you tell people? I mean, obviously what people should do depends on their individual circumstances and, you know, frankly, their their risk tolerance and stuff like that. So you're not necessarily saying, I have a program of action for you to follow. It's more a question of, to me, it's more a question of the philosophy. And the philosophy is there are two sure. ways human beings can interact. They can either interact through threats and coercion and violence, or they can interact peacefully and cooperatively. And I want I prefer the latter, and I want to organize my life around that and be subject to as little coercion as possible. So I'm going to look for opportunities to find like-minded people and interact with them peacefully. But still, I bet there are people who would out there who would appreciate some sort of practical direction. I mean, what, what should I sure. do right now to avoid the state as much as possible? Sure. So the book, obviously, there's how to in the title. So I do try to provide some guides in there. I, I, I hesitate always to give like step by step, you know, here, follow this ex- as if I've got the exact plan. But I do think that there are some insights in the book that can be helpful and some tools. One of them your audience will likely be familiar with, and it's what you talked about with John. John and I co founded the Freedom Cell Network. John Bush started talking about it in 2015, and I picked it up in 2016 and kind of ran with it over the last few years while he was raising his kids. Freedom Cells is a big part of it. I mean, we've been promoting Freedom Cells since 2015, 2016, people organizing in local decentralized groups of eight for skill sharing, knowledge sharing, protection, education, et cetera. And we have not seen the amount of growth we have seen in the last five years that we saw starting in February, March of 2020. Now the website has over 25,000 people from around the world. So that's one thing is I think the key to overcoming and facing you know, wherever this is headed is community that like not only any of us can do this alone. And that community might be your immediate family. Maybe you've got a tight knit family that that's all you really need. And you don't need to go out beyond that. That's your freedom. cell. maybe it's your church, you know, your kind of spiritual community, whatever that may look like, but it could be local activists as well. There are a lot of people out there who do feel alone. And I think finding community is key, especially in terms of where I'm originally from in Texas, you know, where the state of Texas is fighting the feds and the locals are fighting the state and it's all that mess. But parents are going back to school right now and they're having to make their decision. Do I want to pull my kid out of school? Do I want to homeschool finally? Or do I want to send them to school in a mask? Or do I want to send them, you know, where they're trying to mandate vaccines? And again, I think a key to that is having 
homeschooling pods, having community. So that's one thing is if you don't have some sense of community, not just online community, which is great, of course, but we really need people that are in our backyards, in our neighborhoods that we can work with. Because if you see the trajectory this is going, where you already have in parts of France, people literally cannot get inside supermarkets without showing the proof of vaccine, you know, proof of vaccination or test or whatever. Imagine that that happens where you live. It might not, hopefully it won't. But if it did, if you do not have a plan, if you do not have community and your whole life is dependent on those grocery stores to provide for your family and your friends and yourself, you know, it's going to be a tough time. So we're really trying to encourage people to be proactive, to get ahead of the game. The other thing that I put in this, uh, in the book is what I call the freedom formula. And it's just kind of a simple equation to get people thinking about these ideas. So on one side, you have the level of freedom that you desire. You know, think about what does that look like to you? Hey, I want to be free from the state. I don't want to be asked about my vaccination status, or I want to make sure that my children and my my lives are not, you know, constantly being surveyed, whatever that looks like for you. So your level of freedom desire, and you add that to your actual willingness to change. Because as I note in the book, you're going to have to make changes in your life if this trajectory does not stop. I don't see any, I mean, I don't have sort of the most optimistic uh, kind of predictions for where this is headed, but I don't see any reason why the authoritarians, the technocrats would just back off of what they've shown in the last year, that they can get entire countries to lock down, to stay inside, to mask up, to pretty much do whatever they want. So you have to think about that, like what's coming. I don't know if we can all continue to just live our lives like, as we have become accustomed to. doesn't mean we're going to go full Mad Max or whatever, but I do think that there are some changes we might need to make to learn to kind of navigate this paradigm we're living in now, this so-called new normal. So you got your level of freedom desired plus your actual willingness to change. And then from that, you will get your actual experience of freedom. So if your level of desired freedom is you want to live on the land and have a community and live with other families and grow food and you know only use silver and gold and crypto and all these kinds of things. But when it comes to your willingness to change, there's nothing. Maybe you're just working all the time. You don't make time to get up and do this research that you need to, or you're just afraid to take any action or you know whatever it may be. You're not actually following through with your alleged goals. Then your actual experience of freedom is going to differ greatly from what you'd hoped for. So, you know, to determine the best path for yourself, you have to know what your goals are and you have to know what your ideal vision of liberty and privacy looks like. And once you can identify that, then you can begin to ask yourself what you are willing to do to achieve that goal. And so that could involve some so-called sacrifices. But as I put here, there's a couple of questions I asked. I said, do you value the convenience of skipping the line at the airport in exchange for your face print more than you value privacy? That's one proposal that's been put forth that you can, you know, skip the lines if you just start using biometrics. Is it worth losing privacy just so you can download the latest apps and trends? A lot of people hear about some new game or some new app and they just rush to download it. They don't think twice about what the terms and conditions are allowing this company or whoever made it to have access to. And these are just questions that we need to ask. And again, it is going to look different individual to individual, family to family, because I do believe that as a libertarian, like I'm an, I'm an individualist and I can't sit here and claim that there's one single solution that's going to be the be all end all that will work for every single person or every single family. Hey folks, let's take a minute to thank our sponsor, Skillshare. Skillshare is an amazing online learning community and it's offering our listeners a free trial of premium membership. With one membership, you will have access to thousands and thousands of classes on topics ranging from illustration and design to photography, animation, productivity, and a lot more. And these are manageable classes that a normal person like you can fit into a normal schedule. My three eldest daughters have a creative side, and so I've featured all three of them on this program talking about ways in which Skillshare has expanded their horizons and helped them build on existing skills. In fact, now I think about it, my 11-year-old Elizabeth is just about old enough now for her to do a little bit of a spot here for Skillshare. I want to talk to her about that. You'll find classes for every skill level, short lessons, hands-on projects, classes designed for real life that allow you to tap into that creativity that you have inside. I myself have taken nerdy classes on topics like SEO for entrepreneurs, but that's what I need in my creative journey. Well, explore your creativity at Skillshare.com slash Woods and get a one-month free trial of premium membership. That's a one-month free trial of premium membership at Skillshare by going to Skillshare.com slash Woods. You, know, you mentioned uh, early in 
your remarks just now about you mentioned homeschooling, and I, I just want, one thing I want to say about that is that's such a great example of what we're talking about here because that apart from the question of getting the laws changed to allow homeschooling, which I suppose did have some political element to it, in general, what was happening there was that people were not taking on the existing educational establishment. Sometimes we look at these big institutions, we think, oh, I could never overcome that. I could never topple that. But you don't necessarily have to. You build something parallel to it. You ignore it and you build something parallel to it. Yeah, I probably couldn't overturn the entire government school system in the U.S., but I don't, thank heavens, I don't need to do that. <laughs> you know, I, I can simply educate my children and go from there. And what, what other people choose to do, and if they get caught up in that system, well, that's their decision and that's their, I have to focus on my life and what matters to me and what's good for the people who are close to me. So it shouldn't discourage you when it, you look around, you see how entrenched certain ways of acting and thinking are and how big the institutions are that we're, we're up against because oftentimes you can just go around them. Like I created a subscription website with courses on history and economics called Liberty Classroom. I didn't get Yale University shut down or something. I just created my own thing. And now anybody in the world can access that and can learn the sorts of things you won't learn in a classroom. So you don't have to, as glorious as it would be to take some of these big institutions down, the key oftentimes is simply to go around them. Absolutely. And I mean, that's the crux of Konkin's philosophy that I've really kind of tried to live and embody is that you can compete with these institutions, right? And whether that means the state itself or just private corporations that are, you know, not serving the people in ways that we would like or are trying to infringe upon people's liberties, we just create better things. And of course, that is a much longer generational change. And this is something that Konkin acknowledged in New Libertarian Manifesto. But I think it's something that discourages some folks because they want to believe that all I need to do is vote and then that'll fix it. Or all I need to do is go out to this one protest and then that's going to solve all my problems. But if you're like, no, you actually have to change your life. You might have to you know, create or build new institutions or support those who are trying to build those new institutions and you know, circumvent the state, go around instead of trying to compete with them. And not only does that sometimes feel like, wow, that's a lot of work. That's, that's much bigger than just going and pressing a button once every two or four years. But also sometimes people feel like it's, it's not fast enough for them, right? People want to think the change to happen like right now. We want things to be better right now. And I really do think that historically the long, longest lasting changes, true change comes generationally. And it does come through the change that is taught from a parent to a child, grandparent to a grandchild and on and on. And really, I do believe, and as I write in the book, that the steps we're taking today are definitely going to decide the future of the coming generations. You know, I, I really often have been reflecting a lot recently, Tom, on my nieces and nephews, my family that are just too young to know the world prior to COVID, right? They, yeah. they don't know, like, for example, my two youngest niece and nephew, they are going to school now with masks. They are going to have no memory of a world where you get to just travel freely without showing your, your health status or where you, you can't hang out with your friends without masks. My older niece and nephews, they're 10, 11, they'll remember it, but it'll fade. It'll be a distant memory with time. And I just, I can't accept that. And so for me, I really do feel like the steps that I'm trying to take and that I think many others who are getting into freedom cells, and I will say that out of the five books I've written, How to Opt Out of the Technocratic State has been the best selling by far. And I think it's because of the time that it came out. My publishers translate it now to Spanish and to French, and they're working on German. And so people are very much looking for solutions. And I think more and more people are seeing that despite the great work that some folks are trying to do in the Libertarian Party, that it doesn't seem like the long-term lasting solutions are going to come from the political realm. The uh, point you just made about children hits home to me. I have five daughters. Now, the youngest is seven, so she knows on some level that the mask requirement is strange and, and unusual. But we live in Florida, and we've been able to get away with not that many restrictions but I go out of my way. I don't normally propagandize my kids. If they ask me where I stand on something, I tell them. And as they get older and they, they read things that I write, they figure it out. And they're all generally sympathetic to my point of view. But on this, I, you're darn, I do propagandize them. I do tell them, I want you to understand, this is abnormal. I do not want you to accept this. Later in life, when they try to do this to you again, I want you to remember, even if I'm six feet under in the ground, 
I want you to remember my voice telling you, do not give in to this. This is abnormal. It doesn't even work. I mean, after all this, you'd think they'd at least have something to show for it. You can't even tell the difference between states that do it and states that don't. No way. Do not give in to this. So I've been, I've been on them about it. And so it's to the point where if you ask my 16-year-old Veronica about Dr. Fauci, yeah, she won't know every single detail, but she'll give you an earful. <laughs> you know, so she's been getting that, getting that from me. <laughs> So anyway, so it's very important. Yeah. If this isn't dinner table conversation, I don't know what is. You've got to point out the craziness of it. So the book we've been talking about is How to Opt Out of the Technocratic State by Derek Bros, our guest. Now, I'm linking to that on the show notes page. That's tomwoods.com slash 1960-1960. But let's talk about how people can follow you. Now, we've just got done saying that you are a mysterious, you know, you are a man of mystery, you know, with, with few footprints here and there, but there must oh, be I'm ways. all over the place. Okay. <laughs> all right. How do we follow Derek Bros then? Yeah. I, I sort of have this duality of trying to stay out of the state systems while also being all over the internet. Right. So, <laughs> right. Um, but my, my main work, including the book that we've gone over today and my other books, which um, are downloadable for free is the conscious And the conscious resistance network is basically a, outlet that I created in 2013 because I'm not traditionally trained as a journalist. I just realized in 2012, the media was not doing a good job and figured I could figure it out and learn how to do better. So I've started to get into journalism and I realized that I wanted to put out my own kind of outlet that could explore pretty much whatever I wanted, everything from libertarianism and anarchist philosophy to spirituality and meditation. You know, I come from a Christian family. I've spent time, you know, learning about Buddhism and, and a lot of different other traditions. And I'm really have been fascinated by the intersection of anarchism and spirituality, anti-authoritarian philosophy and spirituality. And that worked its way into some of my other books. But the conscious resistance was just like a, a place for me to say, hey, this is where I'm going to put out my reports. I've got a lot of reports debunking all the COVID nonsense you know, just kind of regular news reports, as well as philosophical essays and interviews with other people. So the consciousresistance.com is kind of my main place. And then derekbros.com is just kind of a, a placeholder. If anybody wants to learn more about my my background, my, my story, you know, um, we can talk about that another day. But the reason I got into meditation is because I went to prison when I was 20 years old. And that's kind of what eventually turned me into a libertarian is I, I got addicted to drugs at a very young age discovered, you know, kind of meditation, started doing some healing, discovered Ron Paul, and my world was never the same. And it taught me a lot about how the state works as well. And so if you want to get more background on that, derekbros.com. And then the only other thing I would mention that I would love for your audience to check out is, and it relates to what we're talking about, actually, I'm getting ready to go on tour. This will be my third US speaking tour since 2017. The first one in three years, though, and I'm going on tour. We're calling it the Activation Tour. The website's just activationtour.org. And specifically to talk about the things we're talking about today, Tom, like to promote the concepts in the book, to really go around and visit. We're doing 28 cities across the US, and we're going to be going to some places where the realities of vaccine passports are already affecting it. You know, I'm working with volunteers in every city me and my partner, we're going to be traveling. She's going to be giving a short talk and then I'll be giving a lecture and you know we'll have different community events. But some of the places we're visiting, New York City, for example, San Francisco, for example, the volunteers are already telling me, yeah, we're going to have to do this at a park or we're going to have to do something because they just passed the vaccine passport and we can't even go indoors anymore. And you know, I know most of my audience isn't going to be the kind of people who want to wear masks and I won't ask their vaccination status because it's not my business. But I generally know that they're not going to want to deal with those kinds of things. I don't want to deal with those kinds of things. But already in the United States of America, we're going to be traveling around and kind of seeing, yeah, Florida's open, Texas is open, California's crazy, New York's crazy. So it should be an interesting trip. But uh, we're leaving in just a week. We're starting off in Austin, Texas with John Bush next week. And uh, we'll be on the road all September and October talking about freedom cells, talking about these ideas that we've been covering. And uh, I hope anybody in the audience who wants to come out and connect in person, shake hands, hug, smile without a mask on, will check us out at activationtour.org. But I think that's pretty much most of the places that people can find me. All right. I'm going to take all these and uh, post them also on the show notes page. And for people looking for you or trying to go to your website, we should tell them Derek in this case is spelled D-E-R-R-I-C-K. So Derek Bros, B-R-O-Z-E. I'll have all that stuff up at tomwoods.com slash 1960. Do you have any final word? I, I think you might want to say something. I mean, I, I just want to say thanks again, Tom, for having me on, and I appreciate it. And I said this to you in the email. I thought it was I was reflecting on this before our conversation today that 
we actually met just about nearly a decade ago in New York City around the 10th anniversary of 9-11 when Liberty Fest in New York City was happening. Yeah. So I just thought it was cool to come full circle and get to have this conversation yeah, with you. Yeah, absolutely. And But the unfortunate part of that circle is that we couldn't do that today. I couldn't have met you in New York today at a venue like that. Yeah, that wouldn't happen. Yeah, yeah. We wouldn't be inside of New York for sure at this point. And uh, yeah, and I just, so I appreciate that. I appreciate all the work you've been doing out there trying to, you know, bring some common sense to the conversation. I will just invite everybody to please do check out the book. The reason I make it available to download for free, as you know, Tom, books aren't necessarily, you know, every now and then you might get a couple of royalties here and there, but unless you got a number one bestseller, it's not something you can really depend on. So for me, it's just about getting the information out there. So if you want to buy a physical copy, go for it. But if you can't afford it, please download it. Check out the ideas. If you find value in them, share them. And uh, yeah, that's pretty much all I got. I do appreciate that. And I encourage everybody just to go to theconsciousresistance.com, check out the books tab and download all my work for free. Wow. Great man. Great man. Thank you, Derek, for your work and for your time today. Thank you, Tom. All right, everybody, that's going to do it for this week. We have done now 16 episodes since my return from my brief illness. And we are just cooking with gas here. Now, there is another side to the Tom Woods Show, and that is the Tom Woods Show Elite. This is my private group where we talk about things in an uncensored way. There's no stupid idiots fact-checking you or anything like that. It's not all depressing, although some of it is depressing. But there are glimmers of hope. Like, for example, Denmark is scrapping its whole Corona Pass system, which was like an internal vaccine passport. They're getting rid of all their controls almost immediately. So that's happening. And that's a great sign. There are signs that there are places that are actually going the other way, going the correct way. And so we talk to each other about things like this. and We keep each other up to date and informed about what's happening. We have intelligent conversation and we don't get our posts banned or we don't get some moron telling us that it's out of context or whatever. So we're not on Facebook, haven't been on Facebook for the longest time. I wouldn't even consider starting a group on Facebook. So come join me inside the Tom Woods Show Elite. You will benefit from it tremendously, not just intellectually, but also from the camaraderie you get in that group. Access is through my website, supportinglisteners.com. So go check that out and I'll see you next week. Become a smarter libertarian in just 30 minutes a day. Visit TomWoods.com to subscribe to the show for free, and we'll see you next time. Like the sound of The Tom Woods Show? My audio production is provided by Podsworth Media. Check them out at Podsworth.com.